oh, I mean, my mindset at that point would be I want to win it and, and you know, go on to 46-9. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining, and welcome back to another episode of The Social Kick. It is just me, Dr. John Mullen, physical therapist and strength coach, coach with Luke Paddington, the historian and filmmaker and supposedly comedian working all our videos and social media. And we're fortunate enough to be joined by Mr. 48.2 and the Hunter Free off of Fast British Trials, also a blazing fast 200 free 145.7 in a very fast British trials field. Mr. Matt Richards, how are you doing today, Matt? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you very much. No, that's a nice little intro you gave me there. It makes me, makes me feel good. <laughs> well, I hope to be saying, what, 47.23 here shortly? What are we... Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, don't know. fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. That's the plan. <laughs> exactly. Well, maybe before we get into kind of future projections and things like that, like you said, British trials is, is fairly recent still. Some very fast swimming, not just for yourself, but the British team in general. Um, maybe talk us through those events. Why don't we start with the 100 free? Yeah, of course. So um, the 100 free was was the one we were going into it with with a real focus on. That's what we, we, we'd sort of been targeting from the start of the season um, with a sort of a secondary focus on the 200. Um, you know, I don't know whether you would have seen, I did, I did a couple of 50 frees on meets leading up to, to trials, but that was more just as a, a sort of trial and error, just testing new things and getting ready to race the other rates, uh, other events at that meet. Um, yeah, Luke was heartbroken. He didn't do the 50 free. But he's like, what the heck? I thought this guy was a sprinter. What? Now he's going to do 100, 200? Yeah, I know. Sorry about that, guys. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll incorporate it in the future. It's just uh, we were looking at the, the qualification time for the, the 50 free and it was it was lightning quick. And we were like, this year, that's going to be a real stretch to do. And it would have been uh, 100 free, then the next day, the 50 free, then the next day, the 200 free. So we were like, well, for this year, we'll just focus on the two and then and then try and, and involve the others going forward. So. So, yeah, so like you said, 100 free, um, the main focus that you were going for, um, a best time, a great, great swim for yourself. Maybe talk us through what your mindset was like going into the race and a little bit more about the race details. Yeah, of course. So. Um... If I'm being completely honest with you, I wanted to uh, I wanted to get a little bit more out of that race. Um, so you know, I was I finished the race and was a little bit disappointed with the the time and the fact I came second and not first. Um, <laughs> obviously, that's part of being sportsman. But um, that it was a it was an interesting race. Um, you know, I think I left I left far too much in the tank over the first fifty. Um, you know, I think I've seen a lot of things of, of people saying my back end was really good. Um, and typically I've not always been a back end swimmer. I've been, you know, I can bounce between the two. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I finished a race and I was like, I could, I could go another 50 here. Like I've, I've, I've misjudged this a bit, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm still young. It's, it's a learning experience. You know, I've, I booked my, my seat for, for the summer in that race. And, and that gives me then the opportunity to, to race it again in the summer at Tokyo where hopefully I can make those little adjustments I need to make and continue to drop the time. So what, 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 what is, how do you approach the first 50? So you went out 23, six and, and you, you, you kept something in the, in the tank. What's your tempo? Like, what do you focus on your breathing? Do you just look to relax? Do you not look around? What, what do you think of that first 50? And therefore I'm thinking how we can, that affect you in Tokyo. You might go out like 0.4 second faster. Yeah, so I think the the way I swam that final, um, you know, we were going into it with the plan to try and win it. Um, yeah. So the tactic for it was going to be, you know, we knew that Duncan and Dino were going to be we going to be going quick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was expecting a, a forty seven from Duncan and and didn't really know what to expect from Dino, but I knew he'd be quick. Um, so the plan going into it was sort of to to be out to fifty. Uh, relatively the same sort of speed as them, but just sort of leaving as much in the tank as possible. So, you know, going with them to 50, but trying to just use less energy than them um, and then try and come back harder. So that was that was our plan. And so, you know, you could say I, I executed the plan how we needed to, but I think I could have done with going out sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 quicker um, to get myself, you know, with Duncan on that second 50 to be able to have a chance of coming back. Because I think I was just a little bit too too stuck far back off the off the wall which was you know uh, yeah. ultimately what what ended up with uh with duncan touching the wall in a, a 47 7 mm -hmm. and me a 48 mm -hmm. 2 so yeah but you know like i said it's a great learning experience um yeah. and racing in a field like that is always is always brilliant it's great fun so 
I remember Alex Popov said it took it takes seven years to learn to train, seven years to learn to race the hundred, and then seven years to learn to win the hundred. And I mean, how many hundreds have you raced since U European juniors? A handful. Long course. Yeah, barely any because of because of, because of COVID and things. So it won't won't have been many. It, yeah, probably a handful. Yeah. That really plays into it. Go, John. Yeah, definitely. So obviously a great swim, like you said, a few technical points to to improve on. Um, moving forward, how are you going to try to make those changes? Like you said, try to go out maybe a little bit more. Personally, I've never felt like I had another 50 in the tank after 100 free. So I don't know what that's like. But obviously, that's not how you should be feeling, right? You want to be feeling probably pretty gassed at the end of that and see a 47 on the board. So how are you going to get yourself to go faster? Is it anything with training or is it more just race strategy from this point? Yeah, so I think it's a, a mixture of the two. So I think the 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 race strategy is something that will just come with more practice and more experience. You know, I haven't raced in a field that quick before in my life. You know, that's the fastest long course 100 freestyle race I've ever been involved in. Um, so like I said, that will come with, with practice and just experiencing that more often. You know, Europeans in about two weeks time, I'll be able to experience that again with some, some faster swimmers. Um, but then from a, a training perspective, I think, you know, we, we know what is needed in training. We know what we've got to, you know, we can take away things from trials and, and incorporate that into going forwards. But I think, you know, we got a, a pretty good balance of what we needed leading up to trials. So now it's just about fine tuning all those little bits and, and getting us ready for in the summer. We asked this question of Molly um, McNeil. So you go 47.5 in prelims, you make semis. You go to semis, you go 47-2, you're in top eight. There are, other guys, there are five other guys going 47-1s, 47-2s around you. What's your mindset on the blocks? What are you thinking? Oh, I mean, my mindset at that point would be I want to win it and, and you know, go on to 46-9. Um, you know, I've always been I've always been one to set really big goals of myself. Um, and I think, you know, they, regardless of whether or not I achieve those goals at the time that I've set, I want to achieve them by, um, I always end up, because they're such big goals, even if I just miss them, I've still ended up landing in a pretty good spot. Um, you know, so I'm not going to tell you guys what my goal is for, for you know, the summer because that's, that's you know, top secret. But, uh, uh, you know, I've got I've got some big goals and, you know, I've got got a good plan on how I'm going to get there and a great team around me. So fingers crossed everything, everything goes the way we're hoping it will. Dude, the last Olympic champion was also quite young when he won it. So there we go. In the hundred free. Uh, I think Kyle was was eighteen as well, wasn't he? When he yeah. won it. So, I mean, I'm not saying not saying that. Means <laughs> no, no, you, you got to set your goals, dude. Yeah, for sure. But no, it's it's about timing, about like you said, having the right meet. And obviously, people will say, "Oh, this is your biggest meet, British Trials, Olympics, and even bigger meet." How are you going to respond? Sometimes being naive and and just not you know just going in having fun with it is the best for some people. Um, so when you're at these meets, like you said, British trials, fastest long course meet you're at, um, were you just trying to have fun? Were you nervous? Was it a combination? Yeah, I think so. The the hundred free, I was uh, before the final. I was really nervous. Um, you know, probably the most nervous I've ever been before because, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, this is this is the point that you know I can achieve one of my childhood dreams. Um, you know, to get my seat on the plane. That is something I've always dreamed of doing, you know, I've, I've still got bigger and like, you know, larger goals than, than just making the team. But, um, you know, I was like, this is the, the first step in achieving the rest of my goals. Um, so I, I was really nervous before, before the final of the hundred free, but I think I, I love racing. Um, that's, it's sort of built into me. I've always been really competitive, you know, with whatever I do, but, you know, I'll, I'll never forget my first swimming club I was ever at when I was probably about nine um they t the the coaches and things told my parents one day that I'm too competitive um because I was just constantly wanting to race people and uh you know at the time we didn't really know what that meant but looking back at it now it's like well maybe I was too competitive but it's probably the reason why I've, I've continued to improve because I just I just love competing and love racing so and you're gonna take that into life man being competitive in life is, is how you succeed in any part of life man it's awesome well, I want to kind of sidetrack on that. Too competitive and swimming and wanting to race too much. I do think this, you know, it's maybe not always expressed this way from people, but when we look at kind of the traditional swimming, all right, let's just go do your yardage, go do this, um, 
don't, I mean, not necessarily don't race, but it's not as much racing within practice, right? It's, oh, you're just supposed to make the interval, man. You're not supposed to go fast. You're not supposed to worry about this. Um, what do we think of the transition we're seeing with younger athletes and maybe the ability to race more or how else the swimming community could make athletes like Matt more in tune to swimming? Because some might say, well, screw this. I don't want to play. I don't want to swim that on play, you know, Euro football or any other sport. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, I think things like the ISL are really, mm. really interesting because you guys over there, you know, you've got you you've got your NC two A's and things, and um, so I think the from what I've seen, the American swimming culture is a lot about you know based around just racing a lot. Um, you know, obviously you guys put a load of hours into the training as well, but I think over here, um, you know, you don't see it's, it's a very different system to the the NC two A's, and so I think it is interesting to see how stuff like the ISL can, can make a change and shift it into that, you know, more everybody's racing all the time, uh, mm -hmm. sort of dynamic. Um, and you know, one day if the ISL continues to, to improve, like we all hope it will, um, you know, I'd be interested to see if they ended up becoming leagues below that, if you like. So, you know, yeah. like national, you know, swimming leagues with, within that, that are a similar format, just, sort of the the next league down you know like you said about you know euro football you know you've got the champions league premier league all those different kind of leagues so it'd be interesting to see one day if if swimming could you know shift into that direction i think that would some, be definitely be something i'd be interested in no absolutely um it, we, we can sidetrack today so i want to keep on in, in your practice so you had 16 years at, at hampton with um mark who could we know he's a guest of the show and now you at Bath with y'all. What is your training focused on? On doing a lot of very specific, um, um, you know, gearing up for for working on that on that going up time, that racing, that competitive feel. Do you guys train specifically with those kind of intentions in mind, and also have fun? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, my my squad here, I'm, I'm training under Joel Fink. Um, yeah. We've got eight lads in our squad, um, and that's it. So it's just eight lads. Um, so the dynamic is is really interesting. Um, you know, all the other squads I've ever been in. It's always been a mix of male and female and loads of different ages. But in our squad, you know, there's Callum Jarvis, who's 28, I think. Um, and then the rest of our squad are all between like 21 and me, who's 18. So, you know, the gap between we're all young lads. Um, so I think it's it's quite an interesting team because it's more like a like you'd see of like maybe a football team or, you know, a, a rugby team or something like that, where it's it's, you know, it's just lads being lads. Um, <laughs> you know we, we have a lot of fun in training but you know it doesn't take away from the fact that you know we all we all put a lot of hours into the pool into the gym we work really hard um but i think you know we're all gearing up to to go to the olympics and you know i've, I've always heard a phrase of you know you're not just there to get the tracksuit um i don't know whether you guys have heard that one before but that's yeah. something I, I really live by I, you know I've, I've qualified for the team now but the last thing I want to do is just go there and swim the same way I have before, you know, swim, swim the same races I did at champs. Um, I think now I've made the team. That's just the first step and going on from there. We've just got to continue to try and drop a, as much as we can. So are you guys a mix of, of, of swimmers? Are you all sprinters, mid-D and um, all British? And uh, you know, at what level? A bunch of you going to Euros? What's going on? Yeah, so um, the majority of the lads in our squad are all uh, all British uh, swimmers from all different uh, events. So um, five of the lads in our squad qualified for Tokyo. Uh, wow. So we've got me in the short distance free. We've got Callum Jarvis on the, the 200 free for the for the relay. Then we've got Jacob Peters on the 100 fly, Brody Williams on the 400 IM and Kieran Bird on the 400 free. So it's when you put it like that, it's a really mixed bag. So everybody's, you know, we've all qualified, but all on completely different events, um, which makes it interesting in, in training because, you know, we're always doing different things. Everyone's always sort of split off slightly. You know, we have a similar set, but everyone's got their own different route they're taking. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's a it's a brilliant squad. I love it. So, I'd love to hear how practice structure is set up. Because, like you said, you have a lot of people with different events. It's a smaller group, at least compared to what most people listening will assume. Even like a college um, American team, they have maybe 20, 30 swimmers. So, how does Joel? Um, you know, work with you guys individually and how do you feel like your style or he fits your style best? Yeah. So, I mean, Joel, Joel is like extremely technical and very scientific, mm. um, which I think works really well for me because 
I love to to know what I'm doing in the pool and, and why. I love to know the reasons. It's not that I want to question the coach. It's just that it fascinates me to know how doing this will affect me this way and doing this will affect me another way. It just really interests me. So um, he he writes a program for, for everyone individually and then gives us all what we need. So usually me, Jacob Peters and John o. Adams will do our own sort of thing because we're the, the sort of the sprintier people. Sure. Uh, and then there's, you know, there's two other groups where we'll all sort of split off into three sort of groups, if you like. Um, but then even within those groups, we have slight tweaks that we'll all make because obviously, you know, for example, Jacob, me and John o, Jacob's a flyer, Jono's a backstroker, I'm a freestyler. So we'll do a similar set, but it'll just be slight little changes to, to reflect that. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 very individual, which I think is what makes it work. Um, but, yeah. And what what's a, a set that might come to mind that he gives you, maybe a test set or something regular where you, you do it and you're like, all right, I, I know I'm on fire. I know training is going the right way because the times I'm going now are, are better than they were a little bit ago. Yeah. So uh, every week we'll do uh, some things that sort of that we call them test sets. So we'll have a, a they're not they're not particularly strenuous. They're usually stuff we use to get ready for the main set, but it's just mm -hmm. to see where we're all at. So um, every Monday and Friday, we'll usually do 325s from a dive um time to hand uh just to see where where your speed's at and then at some point throughout the week we'll usually do where the sprinters will have seven 100s off uh, i think it's 140 um and descending times and you get your heart rate and then they put that into a graph to see your times and your heart rates and all that kind of stuff and then the other guys will have uh four 200s similar things so you get your time and your heart rate and then it's pl plotted into a graph just to so th those are the kind of things where we sort of measure where we're at. Um, but, you know, though that's just, like I said, that's just our sort of, we finish our warm up, do that, and then go on to the main set. And what might you be holding on or what might you get down to on, on those seven? Oh, so it's, it's really interesting. So I've got quite a strange heart rate. Okay. Um, usually they tell us what heart rate they want us to hit and see how quick you can go while hitting that heart rate. Um, so I'm never normally allowed to sort of, let it out of the bag on those kind of sets. So I, I, you know, the fastest I'll ever really get down to is sort of 57s, 58s, long course. Um, but that's with, what would, what would it be? What's your heart rate? 142? Well, no, it's quite, <laughs> uh, probably like, what, one, 165 or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, my heart rate is just quite interesting. I get, get loads of uh, stick from the lads in the squad about it because you know we'll be doing a set and they'll all be you know sitting at about 170 and my heart rate's up at like 185 for yeah. whatever reason you know, i'm not out of breath i can come in and chat away to people but my heart rate's just really high so yeah i don't know why but <laughs> do you test your lactate yeah. yeah 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 so we do that quite a lot um depends on the set we don't really do a specific set every week to test lactic but um it's incorporated into certain sets mm -hmm. so we often do on a Tuesday morning, we often do, you know, get suited up and do some race specific stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll quite often get our lactic tested throughout that to see, you know, where it's at week to week and on different things where there's slight changes in what we do week to week, how that mm -hmm. then affects the lactic and that kind of stuff. So, so back to the, the heart rate test, because I'm intrigued a little bit with this. So have they measured your, your max heart rate? Yeah. So I personally haven't which is okay. what makes it interesting. So theoretical H HR max or heart rate yeah. max that they're using yeah. that's why you're throttled a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think a few of the other lads that have been here a bit longer have done the, the max heart rate tests, mm -hmm. but um, I haven't had a chance to do one yet. So we work off what they think it is, but it's sure. quite often we, we end up changing what we think it is to slightly higher because we're like how how does how yeah. does this work? Kind of go faster <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly so no but yeah i don't i don't know exactly what it is yet but i'm sure we'll figure it out at, at, at some point yeah definitely that's just what we've seen with some of our athletes we've worked with where it's like all right we actually need to have individual heart rate maxes on different tests because the numbers are can be way off for some of these people because yeah, yeah. though the predictions are pretty good most of them are based off average people not trained athletes and elite yeah. athletes so just curious with that <laughs> um so obviously we've been getting into training but i want to take a step back to trials again and talk about that 200 um yeah. because 
you know, I wasn't expecting you to pop a time like that in the 200. Maybe I'm just not as well versed in in yourself or British trials, so I apologize about that. But like, <laughs> maybe Lucas, I don't know. But like, tell us a little bit about um, that race. Yeah, so that was probably my favorite race I've I've raced so far in my career. Um, nice. You know, I knew going into it that that was just going to be a a stupidly quick final um you know we were all looking at the we were you know the lads that were going to be in that final we were talking in the morning and we were like you know what do you what do you reckon is going to make the final tonight and the general consensus from most of us was like yeah probably like probably 148 five will be the last into the final and that'll probably be about right um and then we were watching the heats and you know i was in the second heat i think me and me and jimmy and so we were watching it on the the screens in the core room and we were like right okay we're <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna have to get a bit of a shift on here because this is a quick morning. Um, and then the final was just the exact same again. It was just everybody really stepped up, and um, you know, I think we were, you know, me and Joel were were expecting that time. We again, we were hoping for a little bit quicker, mm-hmm. uh, closer to what I was hoping for on that one than I was on the hundred. But mm-hmm. um, you know, that race I got out, and it was one of those where I was like, yeah, I, I couldn't have given any more on on the day today. That was what I had. Um, which is, you know, the way I wanted to be leaving the pool because I, I was annoyed about the 100 that I was leaving the pool, not feeling like that. Um, but yeah, I think you know, you're not the only people that were surprised by that time. I think, you know, all the lads in my squad were all were all surprised by that as well. So I think, you know, people that know me very well were still very surprised about that. So, yeah. <laughs> did you see Duncan and Tom and did you go out of them? Did you say, oh, let's hammer down, let's go for it? Did you race them? Did you switch? Yes. Yeah. So I, I could see Duncan. I couldn't see Tom or past him. Um, so I, I could only see Duncan on that side and then I could see the guys on my other side. Um, so I, my, my plan was I knew that Jimmy was going to go out quick because because that's how he swims the 200. He always yeah. does. Um, I knew that Dino would probably be somewhere near what Jimmy's doing at the 100. And because Dino and Jimmy were both going out quick, Duncan was probably going to do the same. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, that. I'm expecting this to be taken out quickly um but it was a similar race model we used from the 100 but just sort of doubled it if you like we were like well we need to be out with these guys quickly i can't let them get away from me because then i'm going to have no chance of of coming back and coming past them um but uh you know it was the, it was one of those where it was like i've got to i've got to be patient with this and not go too quick too early um and just completely you know die on the on the second 100 so um it, it was a brilliant race and i think you know fair play to duncan and dino that, that they were really 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 quick in that race you know i was trying to come back at them on that last 50 um and they were still just pulling away and i was like yeah this is this is i'm not going to catch them at this point you know i was I was watching the lane markers and i was like yeah i got 50 meters i can catch them up i can catch them up 40 meters maybe this is getting tough 30 meters i'm going to struggle here they're still 20 20 uh, yeah, i'm no i just need to get to the wall now <laughs> but yeah Let's talk about to- <clears throat> sorry. Let's talk about Tokyo and, and, and your events. So you got three events right now. Are you trying to go for your fourth? And what is it going to take for you to get on that that fourth spot, the, the, the medley relay? Yeah. So I think it's it's interesting. So obviously the hundred I'll be doing, the four by one hundred. Um, I'll, it's likely I'll be doing that. And likewise with the four by two hundred, it's likely I'll be doing that. Um, the four by one medley is is really interesting. I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know what the plan is with that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I might be thrown into the heat of that. Maybe I might not be. Um, you know, I think that's all going to come down to schedules and who's got yep. what there and that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. I think you know, Britain are in a, a really nice position on the on the medley at the moment. That there's, I reckon we could probably swim four different swimmers from heats to final in the the medley relay and probably still make the final pretty pretty comfortably. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see what what the plan is with that, but um, you know I, that's not my my decision to make for the day. So yeah, it'll be be interesting though. Well, yeah, definitely. Like you said, the the relays are really going to be intriguing for for the British, and you said the medley especially. I mean, there's a few definitely open open spots where uh, we're excited to see you guys dogfight it and see who's going to actually end up on that relay. Um, but like you said, the the four by one is another relay where you guys are up and coming. So maybe talk us through a little bit about who you expect to be on that relay and what you guys think, what you think you guys will average in place. Yeah, so I think the the four by one is, is fascinating because it's one of those that's 
you know, for, for GB, it's not been historically a particularly strong event. You know, the four by two, we've, we've pretty much always been up there. Um, you know, the four by one medley, pretty much since PT's come along, we've always been up there. Um, and so I think the four by one medley is interesting to see, uh, not medley, sorry, four by one freestyle. It's interesting to see how the, the dynamic is changing now where we've, we're starting to have a little bit of depth in the, the hundred free in Britain. Um, so, you know, I think, Obviously, Duncan's going to be in there. He, he's swimming really well. You know, in his post-race interview at trials, he said he wasn't happy with his 100 either um, and said, you know, he would have liked to have gone quicker too. So I think, you know, both of us thinking that we we can and will go quicker um, will be interesting to see. Um, I think, you know, Dino, I'm pretty sure he's he's publicly said as well that he was a bit unhappy with his time as well on the 100. So, you know, the top three of us have all said, you know, we, we would have liked to have gone quicker. We felt like we could have gone quicker. Um, so I think if us three could drop, like we think we can, that could be, that could be really interesting. And then behind that, you've then got, you know, a whole cohort of people who could be thrown in, you know, Ben proud said in his post-race interview at champs that, uh, you know, he didn't swim anything else at champs because he wanted to focus on the 50, but he'd be prepared to be put into anything else he's needed for, going forwards and so you know it could be interesting to see if he could be thrown in somewhere same you know jimmy guy he's yeah. got a, a very good 100 free you know we've seen him do that from a step in before yeah. jacob whittle you know he swam really well joe litchfield there's 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 a lot of people that could be mixed in there so i think it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting few months on the lead up to the olympics you know people trying to make their their predictions of what that's going to look like um but to be honest with you at the moment i couldn't tell you what my, my prediction would be <laughs> But I'm trying to think. So obviously, sorry, Luke. So US, Australia, probably the two favorites there. Russians. Russians, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I guess do you think a medal spot is possible? Or are we thinking, all right, fourth, fifth, that'd be a pretty solid. No, he wants a great team. world record. Of course he thinks a medal spot's possible. What are you talking about? <laughs> hey, I'm just being honest here, all right? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's um it's really interesting. So I had a look. Um, I don't know whether you guys have seen the, I'm sure you have, the, the Swimming Stats account on Instagram. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so they posted a um, they posted a thing not too long ago with their the current sort of projected times yeah. that the teams will go based on, I think it was from the start of 2019 to mm -hmm. now. Um, I think we were sitting about fifth or sixth on that list. Um, you know, Russia, I'm pretty sure, were at the top and were a fair yeah. bit ahead after their, their recent trials. But then... After that, it was all pretty close together. If I'm, yeah, I think you're right. I'm saying that from about third down to about seventh was all within about a second of each other. Yeah, well, um, so I think the you know the final of that four by one is going to be going to be a really really good race. It's going to be a scrap, um, and I think it's just going to come down to you know who's who's got the you know the the ability to drop into that meet. Um, you know, so you know as far as I'm concerned, I think Brit British women and GB are in a great position to do so. So I think. You know, I'm not gonna not gonna make any predictions, but I'd I'd love to see us sneak a little little medal on that and you know try and get a, a nice coloured medal too. But I, I got I got two questions for you. If what what position really do you like to go on and what position do you think the coach will put you on? Sometimes it's very different, right? <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. like, oh no, we want an anchor because he's got a light of fire under him. Why yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, I uh, it's interesting. It's I just I love racing. Um yeah. like I said earlier. So um, anchor him then. Anchor him. Yeah. yeah. So from my perspective, you know, I love being on the last leg because I love to to just get in and, and just scrap. Yeah. Um you know, if we're going in a little bit behind, I like to just get out there and go after whoever it is that's ahead. If we're going in ahead, I like to get in there and go after any records that could be broken. Um, but likewise, I'm more than happy to go on on first, second, or third legs because you know. I think from my perspective, wherever is going to be tactically the best position for me to be in, um, I'm more than happy to do it. Um, you know, if they want me on the first leg, I'll go on the first leg. And like I said, second, third, fourth, wherever is going to be, you know, most beneficial to the team, um, you know, I'm more than happy to race in. So I think it'll be interesting again to see what the the plans will be with that around the four by one and the four by two, um, you know, how they, how they put those, those teams together. It's not a job I'd want to do. I think that's a, a difficult, difficult decisions to make, but yeah, it should be good. Dude, you're not talking like somebody who's so young in the, in, in the senior international career circuit. You, you haven't been to a senior meet, have you? 
You yeah. haven't you be not talking like that. You haven't you've raced against some of the top swimmers in the world at ISL, thank heavens. But you're not talking like that. What, what, where's that coming from? You just have this this confidence and this surety and this self belief in it. Is it from your parents, your your upbringing? It, it's it's there. Right? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So you know, my my first senior international call up is is Europeans in a couple of weeks' time, yeah. um, which will be an interesting meet because you know our squad is is swimming through that, so we're not we're not having any rest through it. You know, Joel's told us he, he's going to be battering. <laughs> the week we're racing um which is always terrifying to hear from your coach isn't it but um you know i think the the self-belief i think i've always been been very confident in myself and my ability um you know my my support system i've got around me are, are phenomenal my mum and dad have always been been right there behind me they've always you know supported me with whatever i've wanted to do um you know it, it so happens that that's been swimming over the years that's been what i've wanted to what i've wanted to pursue and what i love um, but you know, regardless of that, whatever I've ever wanted to do, they've always been, been right there with me and always, you know, getting up at stupid o'clock in the morning to take me mm -hmm. training or, you know, helping me out with, with homework at school and all that kind of stuff. So they, they've always, they've always been really supportive and they've always believed in me the same way I've believed in myself, which I think makes a huge difference when, you know, the two most important people to you believe in you like you do yourself. I think that, that makes a massive impact on it. Um, Likewise, you know, my, my old coach, Mark Spackman at the Royal, he did a huge, huge job of, of sort of taking me, I joined him when I was 13, 14, mm -hmm. um, and only left him last year. So he did a massive job of, of, of taking me uh, from a young, young lad who, you know, hadn't really done anything in the sport, really, um, and sort of shaping me as, as an athlete and as a person. Um, and I think, combinations of, of that and then other people i've met along the way you know my grandparents you know joel my teammates every, everything always i think it's all sort of come together well and it's it's led to me you know like i said earlier i always set my my really big goals but then um a lot of the time i achieve them and and like i said earlier if i don't achieve them i'm, I'm not far off them and i think that you know that the growth mindset you know i think that really helps with with just believing in yourself and i think you know if I, I genuinely believe if you believe you can do something that, that you, then you can do it. Um, you know, if you don't, if you don't believe it, then it's not going to happen. Um, and, but if, you know, if you can get to a point where you genuinely wholeheartedly, there's not, a, not a tiny little bit in your head that doesn't believe that you can do something. I think that there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Um, and so that's why, you know, I think I am, I am very confident in myself and, and what I, what I think I can do. Um, but yeah, so I guess, It'll be interesting to see see my uh, how things go for my first few senior internationals. John, um, Matt talks like another friend of the show who we know is one of the most dangerous sprinters on the planet right now, David Curtis. So we asked David Curtis the exact same thing. And he said he started the family. He started with anybody who influenced his swimming career and his longtime coach who brought him up from nowhere, from nowhere. And then he talked about his confidence and he's a student of the sport. So, yeah, you guys, you get dangerous, dude. My money's on you, man. Do you Thank think, John? Yeah, it's crazy. No, definitely. Very yeah. insightful. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. Yeah. And obviously yeah. having those people in your life just, just make it a whole lot easier. Um, one thing I'd like to learn about is when you did start seeing success in swimming, because like Luke keeps talking about, because you could probably be Luke's kid, is that you're still a young lad. Um, when did you start seeing success in swimming? Was it at an early age? And, and why don't we start with that? Yeah, so I think I've, I've got an interesting story for you for that one. So when I was uh, a lot younger, um, you know, talking probably 12-ish, um, I made my first county championships um, here, which is basically, um, you know, I, I don't know whether, I don't know, I can't compare it to what it would be like in the States because I don't know what it would be in the States, but it's like, you know, the, the group of local cities mm -hmm. uh, and then you race against them at the county championships. So um, when I was there, you know, I was I was always a lot smaller than all the other guys. I was a lot shorter. I think I was at that point I was a bit of a late developer compared to all the others. You know, my dad's six foot five. Um, so you know, I shouldn't be short, but at that point I was shorter than all my competitors. So um, you know, it was always interesting trying to race them and get up and race these guys who <clears throat> you know, at a young age, you know, the size of you makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Um 
And that was when in the UK, it was still uh, racing as the age on day. So your age on day is is what age you race at at the meets. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at about that time, it was changed to, to fit more in line with the rest of the world where it was age at 31st of December. Um, and so for me, you know, my birthday is the 17th of December. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, that was that was like, I, you know, I heard that news and I was like, wow, <laughs> this is going to get a whole lot tougher now. Like, you know, all these guys are, that are already way bigger than You're me. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be racing against guys who are up to almost a year older than me. Um, but I think that was that was where I, I sort of learned the the resilience and, and not only the resilience, but the understanding of, um, you know, technique and skills and and nailing those things. And, you know, as I then grew up, making sure that I kept those things as nailed down as possible. So, you know, my dad said to me when when that change was made, he was like, look, play the long game. You know, it doesn't matter right now. It, it, nobody cares what you're doing right now. You, you know, you're, you're 12. Like no one remembers who the <laughs> county champion was when they were 12. You know, it's just it's not something that, you know, anyone's going to care about. So don't worry, you know, just work on your skills work on your underwaters your 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 technique all that kind of stuff listen to your coaches and just and just focus on that for now and then as you grow which you will as you grow if you can keep those things you'll you'll be you'll be set you'll be fine um and so obviously at a young age that's difficult that's a difficult lesson to learn um and it was hard to to get to grips with that and understand it but i think once i had got to grips with it and once i had understood that it was like well you know, he's spot on there because then I did grow and I grew up and, you know, when I was 14, 15, then I, I think I broke my first British record and, and won some medals at the British Championships and things. Um, then at 16, that was when I went to European Juniors. <clears throat> I'm tickling my throat. I promise you it's not COVID. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> you can't catch it for a <laughs> um, But, yeah, so then I went to a European Juniors when I was 16 um you know i had a great time there i, I was fortunate enough to come away with a, a gold mm-hmm. a silver and a bronze mm-hmm. um and then obviously then covid hit as we were just saying mm-hmm. um and so since then I, I haven't really had much a chance to race um you know obviously i went to isl uh isl was really interesting for me because i would not had much training into isl um you know i went to isl my first meet at isl was after four weeks of training um, and so trying to then get back up to to a, a fighting fit standard in mm. six weeks when you haven't really got time to train because you're busy racing was 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 really interesting. It was a a, a, a difficult a difficult few weeks um, from that perspective, but you know I learned loads from from that and, and being able to be in the call room with the pe- people like Caleb um, and Flora Manadou and those kind of people um, and race in the races with them and just just get to grips with being around them and in that environment was was huge for me um uh but yeah you know i think in t- from a, a success perspective i think i've not achieved anywhere near what i'm hoping to achieve in my career yet so i think we're just starting to to get my foot in the door and you know what will hopefully be a really long journey yeah i i, I um thanks for that for sharing that i i always thought that isl saved swimming in a lot of ways last year for a lot of swimmers from, from a psychological point of view from a, a, just a surviving everything um the postponement of the olympics has obviously given you a chance to actually make the olympic team by a year um the isl falling last year got your chance to race but the isl falling next year will if you had were 17 you weren't able to experience it what, what, what was your feeling as a 17 year old going in last year how you know and the new rule change. So those who are listening, if you're 18, you um, if you're under 18, you're not allowed to compete anymore. What did you feel as a 17 year old? And the benefit of that is now leading up to possibly being an Olympic contender for champion. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> really difficult um, because personally, I don't understand or know the. I haven't been told the reasons behind that decision or anything like that. You know, it's because you know I'm not <laughs> I'm not somebody that needs to know that kind of thing. It's not. Yeah not my place so um you know i'm sure there will be reasons behind um that decision and that that the the reason for it but um you know from my perspective i think isl last year taught me so many lessons that you know regardless of how i raced um just being there and being in that environment i learned so much while i was there um that i was then able to bring back with me and and use that going forwards into meets like champs um so i do think it's a a bit of a shame that 
mm-hmm. that won't be able to happen anymore for any of the youngsters. But um, like I said, I'm sure there, there's a valid reason for it, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be a, a long thought process behind it. But um, yeah, I mean, like like I was saying earlier, I'd love to see there be maybe a, a junior league version of the ISL at yeah, some point. Totally. If that, you know, if ISL can continue to progress, it'd be awesome to see a an international junior league of ISL. That'd be that'd be great. It'd be fascinating to see you know the up and comings and things. So yeah. What did a 17-year-old Matt Richards learn from his captain, Michael Andrews, or, uh, you know, uh, Caleb Dressel, both on your podcast, by the way? Yeah, yeah. So um, I learned a lot. You know, I think I, I loved um, sitting down with Caleb for, for an hour or so and just and just picking his brains because I was able to learn a lot from him, but not only learn a lot from him, but learn a lot about him from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was able to just sit down and talk to him. And by the end of it, it was like, well, you know, it's not, it's not, oh my God, it's Caleb Dressel now. It's like, yeah, it's Caleb Dressel. That's, it's cool. But mm-hmm. it was like, he's, you know, he's human, you know, and that was what, that was something that I hadn't learned before because I hadn't been in that environment. I'd never met those kind of people. Um, you know, I, I'd met the the British equivalents of them, but I'd never met the the ones in the other countries and, and Caleb, who obviously at the moment is the top dog in, in my events. Um, but it, it was really useful for me to just learn, you know, these guys at the very, very top are no different from, from you or me. You know, they're all humans. They're all made out of the same thing. They, you know, they all wake up and, and eat the same way that we do, you know? So I think I learned loads from that. Um, you know, I learned a lot from Michael as well. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to do a couple of sessions with him while we were there. Um, you know, do a bit of USRPT as, as I'm sure you guys know, he likes to do a lot of, um, yeah. But yeah, trying to keep up with him on backstroke was was interesting. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I learned so much, so much from ISL. Um, and you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how this this draft's going to work and all that kind of things over the next few weeks. I'm assuming it will be now. But yeah, yeah. yeah, it's good. Yeah, first of all, Caleb, you heard it. The best in his events. He's a 200 freestyler, so we need a 142 on that relay out of you, Caleb. Um, <laughs> second. You mentioned the draft. Um, obviously, you you won't be. Um, I guess you're in the draft, but you won't be in like the new summer pool draft type of thing. So, of the kind of new summers coming into ISL from the UK, who do you think is are some of the favorites to be drafted early on? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really interesting. So, I don't actually know who's put themselves into the draft other than yeah. the guys in my squad. Um, That's part of it too, right? Yeah, just not everyone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the guys in my squad, I think, you know, the likes of, of Jacob Peters and Brody Williams and, and Kieran Bird, those guys I think will be really interesting to see, you know, if they get picked up by teams and if so, which teams, um, you know, because it would be, be awesome to see them. They're, you know, I think it's interesting because in the UK, we don't really have any meets where we taper for short course um so i well, I, you know i'm saying the uk it might be the same all across the world i, I might just be being very naive but um you know it, it, i think it's interesting because we we never really show what we could really do short course you know uh but then by the same token at isl you don't have time to be tapered so i think that's probably useful because it's more accurate of what you can do time and time again um so yeah i mean it, it, it'll be interesting to see who's who's picked from the uk and from all the other countries and i think it'd be nice to see uh you know a bit of a balance of all the teams and and see see how that's going to affect you know the leaderboards i remember watching this show with um Sun Tzu guy sunny Treg, mm-hmm. and um and, and sunny was like watch out for this guy tom dean you gotta watch out for him and we were like tom dean really and that's what the isl does it yeah. lets us know the talent we don't know about and that was great so i'm looking had to such a me. bad first swim didn't he, and he did. ISL, then he dropped a bomb and then and then he ended up winning some events i think so yeah we we're like oh sonny what go review some more some suits man stay in your lane sonny was spot on <laughs> and he went and then he went and beat rapsis on a 400 free and everyone was like oh okay oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Raps is counted right for a second. Oh, he beat him. Uh, hey, Matt, what's next for you? So you're you're doing A-levels now? Is that right? Uh, no, actually, I'm not. So I would have been doing my A-levels. Um, but last year when I made the move to Bath permanently, 
uh, I actually put that on hold. Yeah. Um, so you know, to be honest with you, I don't know if I'll if I'll go back to that anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I've sort of put that on pause for now, and I was like, well, if I'm moving down to Bath and to the National Centre with with all these guys who are doing it professionally and as their job, you know, I want to embrace that environment and, and do it the same myself. And you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I love. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, what's the point in in sort of half-heartedly doing my A-levels and putting all my effort into swimming when I could just, you know, take that stress and that pressure away from the A-levels, just focus on swimming. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing at the moment. And it's all just, you know, based around swimming, which is luckily is what I love. So, you know what, you know what, you know where it does not care if you have A-levels or not? The NCAA system. <laughs> True. True. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, not many British go to the NCAA system, but when they do, they make it. I mean, Simon Burnett came and destroyed the system back a long time ago. Um, is that even on your radar at all? And not many, or it's because you've got a, a strong backing of the of the training centers. Like, talk about that, the NCAA push. Yeah. So it, it's it's really interesting to me. Um, it's something that I've I've thought about and and had long conversations with people about and and genuinely just spent a long time thinking about it um in the, it's really interesting uh you'll, you'll probably find it funny the reason why i decided against it um but the re the the ultimate reason why i decided against it was because i was like well there's a lot of money to be made in this sport in the uk when you're not in the ncaa's and actually if i go over there you know I, i'm gonna have to put that on hold for four years and i was like well how much I potentially earn in the next four years if I stay here and how much would I lose out by going there and would the difference in you know would the the performance gains from going there or staying here match that and I was like well actually I think the performance gains would be the same at both you know I think as long as I've got a good coach and a good environment uh, you know I think I'd, I'd be able to thrive wherever that happens to be whether it was uh, a uni in the states or you know the national center here um so i was like well at the moment i don't think there's i don't think i can sort of take away from that money because you know in, in this sport <laughs> there's not much to be earned you know four years in this sport is a week for a U, uh, uk uh footballer so it's like well yeah. you know, that's a lot of money to to say yeah. no to um and you know i don't i don't know what my future is going to hold um so you know, I, I was I almost playing it safe and I was like, well, for now, I think I need to stay here um, and and sort of try and build up that financial cushion. Um, yeah. Because like I said, there's just, no, you know, totally. in, in this sport, you don't earn hundreds of thousands of pounds a week because yeah. it just, just doesn't happen. You know, I'd love to see that happen one day. You know, if ISL and things, uh, you know, that kind of stuff can progress. Um, be amazing if that could happen one day. But by the time that's likely to happen, I'll probably have retired. But um so yeah that was that was the the overall reason why i decided against it but you know i, I think the nc2a system is, is fascinating to me and I, I i still find it very interesting um but you know I, I've, I've made that decision and uh, you know i'm pretty confident that at the moment the the setup i've got is more than more than i could ask for so yeah, you mentioned kind of the, the earning potential. And like you said, you never know when your career is going to be done. You know, this is, may, you know, could be the best opportunity for you these next four years. Uh, I'm always intrigued with how swimmers that aren't Michael Phelps, that aren't Caleb Dressel, are making money. And we don't have to get into the specifics, but I'd love to learn more about your different revenue streams that you have now or that you plan on getting into because you seem to be a, you know, an entrepreneurial man. Check out his website and YouTube channel if you haven't already. But I'd, we'd, like I said, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing now and what you envision. Yeah. So, I mean, like, like we were just saying, the sport itself, there's not a lot of money to be earned unless you're prepared to go out of your way to earn it, if that makes sure. sense. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's, it's about finding a balance between being prepared to go out of my way to earn that money, um, but not doing it in a way that's going to detract from my training and from, from what the reason why I do this sport. And the, that, that reason is solely because I love it. Mm -hmm. Um, like I've said countless times on this podcast already. Um, but you know, if I wanted to go and earn a load of money from sport, I would have gone into football or gone over there and done basketball or american football football as you guys call it um but you know so I, i'm very interested in 
in things such as property or real estate, um, that kind of thing that really fascinates me, but I need to have a bit more money in the first place to get into that. So that, that one interests me for the future. Um, you know, I've done a little bit of research into, into the, the stock market and how that kind of stuff works. But mm -hmm. I, I think the conclusion I was like, look, unless I've got time to do this full time, it's just, just going to be gambling for me and I'm <laughs> not prepared to do that. So, um, that's not something I, I'm, I'm likely to, to go into, I don't think, but, um, then there's all sorts of other things that interest me, you know, various different sponsor opportunities that are, are, are looking like they could come up. They, they interest me, um, you know, YouTube at some point, if that was to earn me a bit of money, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the fundamental reason why I do it. I do it again, just cause I enjoy it. But, um, you know, further down the line, if that was to earn me money in the future, that'd be, that'd be lovely. But, um, like you said earlier, I think something, something I want to do before I end my career is make sure that I've got multiple different revenue streams and 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 streams of income because you know i don't want to be getting towards the end of my career and going yes yeah, you know it's going to be time for me to retire soon um you know what am i going to do about money i need to I need to get a job i need to sort this all out and i don't want to be you know putting that stress and pressure on myself when i'm still trying to perform and compete at a, a high level um so you know if i can put stuff into place in the background um that then you know takes that that away towards the end of my career that'd be that'd be awesome that'd be all i could ask for really man when i was 18 years old i all i did was think about getting up to the pool and working hard that's amazing man that's so like well grounded and and mature like like kudos dude yeah thank you I, and I fully agree all right man we got some rapid fire questions to finish up with <laughs> Sounds all good. Right. first what's the hardest race in swimming oh I'd have to say 200 fly. I don't think I could finish one at the moment, to be honest with you. I'm that sore, but <laughs> well, well, let's let's don't think about the pain side. Think about what's the the, the hardest one, not painful. What do you think is the hardest one to execute? Look, rapid fire, Jeez. Rapid, okay. Come on, I'm an old man. I've lost my speed. Okay, I've lost my speed. <laughs> there you go. Finally, some truth hits. <laughs> All right, Olympic gold, world record, or ISL MVP? Uh, world record. Okay. Um, you went to Royal Wolverhampton. Mm -hmm. What is the mascot for that? Believe it or not, we don't actually have one. Um, oh. I think the UK is it really, you know, I'd love to see UK's uh, schools and colleges have mascots, but they're not, they're just not as big over here. But, you know, I think we could, we could have like a well, Wolverhampton. So we could have a wolf, I guess that, that could work, but <laughs> That's what I was thinking. All right. So um, we'll stick with the UK theme, I guess. So you're from the city of, and I've, people are drilling me on this because I can't pronounce anything from Worcester. But you're not far off. So it's Worcester. Okay. Uh, I mean, that one gets butchered all the time. It's Worcester, 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 all sorts, but you weren't far off. Why do Americans say Worcester style sauce? I can't even say it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's Worcestershire sauce, but uh, I mean, then then Americans also say aluminum. So I mean, I don't know. You, you guys, you guys have your own take on on words. <laughs> there you go. What is your favorite thing to put that sauce on? Oh, to be honest with you, uh, this is this is awful. So I'm from Worcester, but I, I've never I'll, I'll say it. Like I'll sauce. say it. I know my mum puts it in spag bowl. All right, <laughs> bolognese. So. <laughs> All right. Um, in what year, when we search Matt Richards online, will you be the top result? Oh, uh, I mean, hopefully this year. That would be great if we can sort that out this year. That that would be that would be ideal. Excellent. Who wins the four hundred medley relay at the Olympics? Oh, I've got a back GB. I'm going to have to say GB. <laughs> All right, Matt, that's all we have for you there. Thanks again for joining us and, and your honesty and openness there. That was really a uh, great chatting with you here today. Luke, good work. Meg on the background, thanks again for joining us. And everyone, thanks for listening. If you did enjoy this, please like, subscribe, and follow us so we can get you some more great content coming soon. Have a good day. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick, 
And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.